All right, we're going to continue on with chapter 5, uh, moving on to the second half of it now. And right, it works a lot better if only one person is talking um, at a time. All right, so, the, so today we're going to talk about chemical equations and stoichiometry, so more things related to moles and, and different relationships involving moles for, for species that are participating in chemical reactions. Now, before we get into chemical reactions, we're going to talk one more thing about mass percent. So what we sort of ended with last time was the relationship between the chemical formula and the mass percentages of the elements in the compound and how we can interconvert between the two. Um, and now today we're going to start with a sort of an indirect way of doing this. So you may wonder experimentally how do we determine mass percents for compounds. And one way we do it is called combustion analysis. So this is kind of just a roundabout way of getting... The, the mass percents are getting the masses of the elements and then converting that into an empirical formula. So the idea here is you have some unknown compound and combustion analysis typically applies to organic compounds because those are the compounds that can burn, things that have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, sometimes other stuff in them. And so what you do in this type of analysis is that you take your compound, which is sometimes very precious to you, and you just set it on fire. Um, so it's kind of dissatisfying in that regard, but the information that you get out of it is very useful. So your organic compound is going to have some carbon in it, it's going to have some hydrogen in it, it's going to have other stuff, which I, like I said, could be oxygen, nitrogen, possibly a lot of other things. And so then when you burn this, all of the carbon gets converted into carbon dioxide, all of the hydrogen gets converted into water, and then all the other stuff gets converted into other things that we have to tell you about. So you're, when you remember when you burn something, you're you're burning it in the presence of oxygen, so that's where this oxygen comes from that's in the water and the CO2. And that's sort of what happens to your compound. You burn it and you make carbon dioxide, water, and a bunch of other stuff. And so what you can do then is, from the amount of carbon dioxide that you form, you measure the mass of carbon dioxide, and then you can indirectly relate that to the mass of carbon that was in the original sample, because we have conservation of mass here, so all of the mass of carbon that's in your original sample is going to end up in the carbon dioxide as some fraction of that mass. And then same thing for water. All of the hydrogen that was in your organic compound that you burned is going to end up in water, and you can use this then to calculate the mass of hydrogen. So you measure the mass of water and extract the mass of hydrogen. And then for this thing that we call other stuff, which could be, like I said, a, a number of different possibilities, you're going to get this by difference. So you know the total mass of compound that you started with. And if you subtract the mass of carbon, which you can get from the CO2, and you subtract the mass of hydrogen, which you can get from measuring the amount of water that you form, you can then get the mass of everything else that's in the compound. Um, and so once we have masses of all the elements, now again, if there's more than one type of element here for this other stuff, you can't get all the information you need. But if it's just three elements, you can get the mass of every element, and then you can use those masses to determine the empirical formula. And this is one of the steps that's used to identify unknown compounds. So very often people will identify, you know, I, I isolate a compound from a natural source. They want to know what it is. And one of the things you can do is you can burn it and then find the empirical formula, or at least the amount of carbon and hydrogen that's in there. All right, so let's see how uh, this, this works in a real example. All right, so this is going to take... These problems are pretty tedious. There's nothing here that we haven't seen before. It's all pretty much related to, to topics that we've covered in recent lectures, but it's a lot of steps and a lot of things to keep straight, so let's go through all of them. All right, so if we take a, a compound that consists of carbon, hydrogen, and bromine, and again, remember this bromine is going to be what we abbreviated on the last slide as the other stuff, so it's the stuff that doesn't directly burn. We, we burn this compound, and we, we take five grams of it, combust it, and we end up with 0.871 grams of carbon dioxide and 0.179 grams of water, and then we want to know what's the empirical formula. All right, so like I said, this is just an indirect way of getting the masses of all the elements. And so the mass of carbon in this compound is going to come from the mass of carbon dioxide that forms during the combustion. 
And so we can do this sort of conversion to get that. Now we need to start by getting the masses of carbon. We could use the mass of carbon dioxide to get the moles of carbon directly, but we're going to need the mass of carbon first because we need to find the mass of the other stuff that's in there. So we're going to start with the mass of carbon and then eventually we'll convert it to moles. So if we have, we can do a, a series of conversions here. We start with 0 0.08, sorry, 0 0.871 grams of carbon dioxide. We can convert that into moles using its molar mass. So the molar mass of CO2 is 44. We'll need that. I can give it to you here. And for water, it's going to be 18.02. All right, so those will maybe not be given to you in every problem, but we can, we can calculate those. We'll use these numbers. All right, so we have our molar mass of CO2 gets us into moles of CO2 that formed. And then for each mole of CO2, remember what we're interested in is the amount of carbon that's in there. So what, per, you know, what portion of this 0.871 grams of CO2 is the carbon? So for each mole of CO2, we also have one mole of carbon present because the formula is CO2, just one carbon in there. So there's one mole of carbon per mole of CO2. And then the atomic mass of carbon from the periodic table is 12.01. So there are 12.01 grams of carbon per one mole. And so in this series of steps, we've converted from grams of CO2 into grams of carbon. Again, converting to moles and then using the mole, the mole ratios from the chemical formula and the atomic mass. And so what we get is 0 0.238 grams of carbon. Another way to think about this is we know that CO2 has a certain mass percentage of carbon. And so we're figuring out if we have 0 0.871 grams of CO2 with a certain mass percent carbon, how much of that 0 0.871 grams is consisting of carbon itself. Unless my battery's dead, so give me a second here. <coughs> Alright, so we have to do that also then for, for water. So the next step would be then to find the mass of hydrogen that's in there, starting with the mass of water that we're given that came out of the combustion reaction. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing for water to get the mass of hydrogen. The calculation is almost identical. So we're starting with the mass of water that we're given, 0.179. We can convert that into moles. Again, using its molar mass, which is 18.02. Now here's the key step we have to remember is that in H2O, if we're looking for the amount of hydrogen that's in there, there are two moles of hydrogen per mole of water. That's what that subscript 2 next to the hydrogen tells us. So if we want the amount of hydrogen, then we have to keep in mind that there are two of those. So there's two moles of hydrogen per mole of water. Then we convert that into grams of hydrogen using its atomic mass, which is pretty close to 1. and we get 0 0.0200 grams of hydrogen. All right, so that's how much carbon was in our sample. That's how much hydrogen was in our sample. We used the carbon dioxide in the water. And now everything else, we started with five grams that we burned. Everything else is going to be bromine. So all the carbon goes into carbon dioxide. All the hydrogen goes into water. Whatever's left is going to be the other stuff, which in this case is bromine. So if we want the mass of bromine, we know that we started with 5.00 grams of compound. And in this 5.00 grams, there is 0 0.238 grams of carbon. That's what we just found. We have 0 0.0200 grams of hydrogen that we just found. And so that means we're left with 4.74 grams of bromine. So most of the 5 grams for this compound is bromine, the other stuff in this case. All right, so we have a little bit of carbon, a little bit of hydrogen, and a lot of bromine by mass, because bromine has a much higher atomic mass. All right, so those are the steps that we use to find the masses of each element. 
And now that we have that, we're going to do the problem exactly the same as what we did last time, which is convert the masses of each element into an empirical formula. All right, so remember then the steps that we, that we use for this are we take each of these masses, we convert them into moles, and then we find the lowest whole number ratio of those moles. Okay? So going on to the next page here, if we want to find the moles of carbon, we found that there was 0.238 grams of carbon in this sample, and we use the atomic mass of carbon to convert it back into moles. In some sense, we're kind of undoing the last step of the calculation we did above. Like I said, we need the mass of carbon to be able to find the mass of the other stuff, the bromine, so we can't really skip that step. And what we find is we have 0 0.0198 moles of carbon. So we're converting the mass into moles, again, just by dividing by the atomic mass. Grams cancel out, we're into moles. And then we do the same thing for the other two elements. Hydrogen, we found that there was 0 0.0200 grams. And the atomic mass of hydrogen is pretty close to one, so it'll be about the same amount. All right, so we have 0 0.0198 moles of hydrogen also. And then if we do bromine, we saw that most of our five grams was bromine. So we have 4.74 grams of bromine. And if we go to the periodic table, the atomic mass of bromine is 79.9. So we're going to use that number to convert from grams into moles for bromine. And we get 0 0.0593 moles of bromine. Okay? So those are the moles of each element. Now we just have to find the lowest whole number ratio by dividing by the smallest one. So our empirical formula in non-standard form is C 0 0.0198, H 0 0.0198, BR 0 0.0593. We divide each of those by the smallest, which is 0 0.0198. And this comes out to CHBR3. All right, so this slide here is the exact same step, set of steps that we introduced last time. The only difference with these combustion analysis problems is that we don't directly give you the masses of each element or even the mass percents. What we give you is a mass of carbon dioxide and a mass of water that formed during the combustion reaction. You have to use those masses to extract the mass of each element. So it's a bit more involved. There's a lot of steps, but none of the steps should be too foreign to us because they all just relate to conversions between masses and moles, things that we've been doing really about the last week or so. All right, so any questions on combustion analysis before I move on to a slightly new topic? Okay, so what we're going to move on to now is start talking about chemical reactions. So the way that we, the way that we uh, show chemical reactions on paper is using what's called a chemical equation. And so when we have a chemical reaction, we know that the atoms or the elements are reorganized to form new substances. We've kind of, in general terms, referred to chemical reactions. So how do we represent this on paper? We write out what's called a chemical equation. And so the chemical equation really has three main parts that are important. We have the reactants, which are the elements or compounds, elements and or compounds. that are consumed. All right, so these are the things that we're putting into the reaction. And then the products are whatever comes out of that chemical reaction, whatever they're changed into. So these are another set of elements and or compounds that are formed. All right, so again, when you do a chemical reaction, you're putting in some reactants and they're changing into products. And then coefficients are going to be representing the number of, of each element or compound that participates. So we're going to put numbers in front of each chemical symbol, whether it's an atomic symbol or a chemical formula. And these are going to tell you the number of each that are involved. And when we see these coefficients, Let me 
possible if you get. I'll get it for you. Okay, so fumbled it again. I'm not doing this a second time. <laughs> so, um, those are the number of. So the coefficients tell you the number of atoms or molecules or moles of each substance that are involved. Okay? So when we, when we read these coefficients in chemical reactions, there's going to be numbers that occur before each symbol. We can interpret it either at the atomic level, which is that this many atoms and molecules react to form this many atoms and molecules, or What's more convenient, especially for the types of problems we're going to be doing in this section, is interpreting it as this many moles of each species reacts to form this many moles of each product. Okay, so they can really be interpreted in two ways, but they're going to tell you the number of each that's involved in the reaction. And the reason we have to have these in the, in the, in the way that we're going to know which, which coefficients to put is that we have to follow the law of conservation of matter, or conservation of mass, which is that atoms are neither created or destroyed. So if we have so many of one type of atom that's in our reactants, so many moles of that atom or so many uh, you know, atoms of that, we have to then have that many on the product side as well. So there has to be that balance between the reactions and products. Everything we put into the reaction comes out on the other side as products just in a different form, but we're not creating or destroying any, any atoms or mol or, sorry, any atoms during that process. We're not creating or destroying mass. All right, so let's look at the steps then for balancing a chemical equation. So we want to write out a chemical equation in the proper form with the proper coefficients. So how do we go about and do that? So the first thing we have to do is arrange the reactants and the products. Most of you have probably seen chemical equations before and we've kind of already shown them in some of the things we've talked about. But as you'll, as you'll remember, the reactants are on the left side and the products are on the right. Right, so that's, where, that's how we're going to arrange things conventionally. And then we have to add the coefficients to balance out the, the number of atoms on each side of the, of the, of the equation. So there's, there are some tricks to doing this. We'll learn a few of those as we go through different types of reactions. But in general, what you're going to really do is kind of a guess and check method. You're going to start adding coefficients and then adjusting other coefficients until you get it right. But what's sometimes very helpful to do is you're going to set the most complex species to one. And what I mean by most complex is the one that has the most different atoms in it, in the formula. So we'll put a coefficient of one in front of that, and then we'll balance everything else based on the most complex one. All right, I think that's often going to be the easiest way to do it, as we'll see when we, when we start balancing some of these reactions. So find something that looks particularly complicated, set it to one, set it to a coefficient of one, and then start adding coefficients to the other things to try to get the atoms to balance out. And try not to mess with that coefficient of one. If you start messing with one coefficient, you affect all the other ones. You don't want to do too many things at once. And so I, that's why it's helpful to sort of pick one. And then we're going to adjust the coefficients. Like I said, we're going to keep um, adding more until the, everything balances out. So you have to make sure the atoms balance on each side of the arrow. And in general, by convention, we use whole number coefficients, although this is not a hard and fast rule of any sort. Sometimes on, on homework and tasks, we will specify that you should use whole number coefficients, so make sure you do that, but in, you know, in a lot of chemistry literature that you'll see it's not necessary to use whole number coefficients all the time, but we'll usually ask you to do that so when we ask you questions we can have a standard answer that you can pick. All right, and then we're going to check our work after we've added the coefficients. So the key thing is that the number of atoms on the right of each type equals the number of atoms on the left.
All right, so we're gonna, after we've added all the coefficients, we're gonna add up all the atoms of one type that's on the left side of the equation, and it should match the number of atoms of that type that are on the right side, and vice versa. So it's always good to check your work after you're done to make sure that works. And then finally, one other thing that's often indicated in chemical reaction, chemical equations, it's not going to affect the way that we use these when, we, when we're doing problems with them that we're gonna start doing, but they are an important point in some cases, are the states of matter. So whether the species that are involved are solids, liquids, or gases is what we're gonna start with. So you'll sometimes see these little letters that are next to the species in the chemical equations, which will be in parentheses as an S would be mean it's a solid. L means it's a liquid. G means it's a gas. Again, for chapter five stuff, this is not terribly important for stuff that we're learning in this chapter, but it'll start, we'll start to see it uh, a little bit more importantly in, in the next chapter, and especially when you start taking chemistry too, the states of matter for things that are involved in chemical reactions is going to be very important. Um, but for now, just be aware that it's there, but it's not always necessary to have it. All right, so let's start looking at how we can balance chemical reactions. So this reaction here is what's called a combustion reaction. So we're going to start learning about different types of reactions, and the one that we should become familiar with now for this chapter is what's called a combustion reaction. It's a very special type of reaction. We kind of already talked about it at the beginning today with combustion analysis. And so what you do in a combustion reaction is you take a hydrocarbon, something with carbon and hydrogen, or a carbohydrate, something that has hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen, and you, you burn it in the presence of O2, and you form CO2 and water. So every combustion analysis, or sorry, every combustion reaction is gonna look the same. You have some compound as one of your reactants, you combine that with O2, and then you form carbon dioxide and water. So if we ask you to write a chemical equation for the combustion of whatever, that's what you have to have in there. O2 is a reactant, CO2 and water is the other products. For most chemical reactions, we're not gonna have you, you know, predict the reactants and the products, we're just gonna give you the reactants and products and have you balance them, but there are certain types that you need to be familiar with, and combustion is one of them. So this is one of those, we're taking ethane, which is C2H6, and we're burning it in the presence of oxygen to make CO2 and water, and so how do we balance this? So like I said, one of the things that's, that's helpful to do is to pick the species that's the most complex or that has the most atoms in it and set that equal to one. So of these ones, there's maybe not an obvious choice, but if you look at C2H6, that has eight total atoms in it, two carbons and, eight, and six hydrogens, and that's gonna be more complex than the rest of them, which only have two or three. So let's set that coefficient to one, and let's not touch that coefficient until we've adjusted all the rest if it's necessary, okay? And so if we look at what's going on here, we see that Oxygen appears twice on the product side, so we don't want to start by balancing oxygen because whatever coefficient we add to this and whatever coefficient we add to that is going to affect the coefficient we put in front of O2. So if you see something that appears twice on one side of the reaction, an element that appears twice, in this case it's going to be oxygen, which appears in both products, you kind of want to balance that last. So let's start with carbon because carbon only appears in this reactant and in this product. So however many carbons that we have from the reactant should equal the number of carbons that we have in this product. C2H6 has two carbons. That means we need to have two carbons in CO2. So we'll put a coefficient of two in front of it to make sure that we have two total carbon atoms. And then we can do the same thing for hydrogen. We have six hydrogens in our, our reactant ethane. And the only place that hydrogen appears on the product side is in H2O. So if we wanna have six hydrogens from water, we need to have three water molecules or three moles of water so you have a total of six hydrogens. So remember when we're totaling up the number of each type of atoms, you take the coefficient and you multiply it by the subscript to get the total of each. So right now we have two times one for carbon, which is two total carbons, three times two for hydrogen, which is three. Now we have to balance the oxygen. So again, once you've set the coefficients, you don't ideally wanna change them after you've set them to something. So the only coefficient now you wanna adjust is this last one here, which is O2. So if we look what we have on the, on the product side for oxygen, on the product side we have two CO2, so two of those with two oxygens each. And we have three waters, and each water has just one oxygen. So in total we have seven oxygen atoms on the product side. Okay, so we added up the number of oxygens that we have on the product. We need that to balance now what's on the reactant side. 
So O2 doesn't have a coefficient. If we want to have seven oxygens, each oxygen has, each O2 has two atoms of oxygen, we'll put a fractional coefficient of seven over two there. So this is a case where right now we have no choice but to put a fractional coefficient to keep the number of oxygens balanced. All right, so right now this is a valid balanced reaction, um, but typically what we'll ask you to do on homework assignments and tests is write it without, without fractional coefficients. So if you put a fractional coefficient in, the way you can get rid of it is to take every single coefficient and multiply it by something to get rid of that fraction. So if we have a denominator of two in this fraction, if we multiply every coefficient by two, that will get rid of the, the so we're gonna take this whole set of coefficients, multiply it by two, and that'll give us then whole number coefficients. Now remember, because this is a balanced reaction, whatever we do to one coefficient, we have to do the same thing to the other one. So we can't just double this coefficient to get rid of the fraction. If we double this one, we have to double all the rest of them as well. So we're gonna double every single coefficient in this, and that will keep the reaction balanced, assuming that we did our job the first time. So we're gonna balance the co we're gonna double the coefficient in front of ethane to give it make it two. We'll double the seven halves to make it a seven. We'll double the two that's in front of CO2 to make it a four, and we'll double the three that's in front of water to make it a six. All right, so these are gonna be the smallest combination of whole number coefficients. There's nothing that we can divide these by to reduce them any smaller, so that's gonna be the smallest combination we can get. And like I said, the last thing that we often wanna do is check our work to make sure that it works out. So if we look at the left side or the reactant side of our equation, we're going to do it for each element that's in the, in the equation. So for carbon, on the left side we have two ethanes, each with two carbons. So we have a total of four carbons. And then if we look on the right side for carbon, on the other side of the equation, on the other side of the arrow, we have four CO2s. Each of those has one carbon, and so we still have a total of four carbons. So we have four carbons on each side, so carbon is balanced. If we do the same thing for hydrogen, on the left side of the arrow, we have the only place that hydrogen appears again is in this first reaction, reactant here. We have two of those, each with six hydrogens. So we're gonna have a total of 12 hydrogen atoms on the left side. And then on the right side of the chemical equation, hydrogen only appears here in water. We have six waters, a coefficient of six. Each water has two hydrogens, total of 12. All right, so the carbon and hydrogen balances. Now let's check oxygen. So oxygen here on the reaction side only appears in O2. So we have seven O2s. Each, so each one has two, of course, and that's gonna give us 14 total oxygens. And if we look at the right side of the equation, the product side, Oxygen appears twice here. So we have four carbon dioxides. Each of those has two oxygens, so four times two is eight. And then we also have six waters, each with one oxygen atom. So six times one, so eight plus six is also 14. All right, so we've double checked our work and all of the, the atoms balance out, so we don't have to do anything else to this set of coefficients. All right, so it's always good, especially if you have time, to check your work at the end, make sure that it works out. All right, let's do a couple more of these just to get some practice with different types. All right, so rust, Fe2O3, which we call rust, is formed by the reaction of iron and oxygen gas. Oxygen gas has the formula O2, and we want to write a balanced equation for the formation of rust. All right, so iron just has the formula Fe. All right, so this is kind of another... A variable we can give you. Sometimes we're not going to give you the reactants and products in detail. We're just going to sort of give you in words what they are. So iron is one of the reactants that has a formula Fe. It's just, it's just an element. And then oxygen, as we told you, is O2. And then the product rust is Fe2O3. All right, so this is exactly what happens when, when something rusts. The iron on the surface reacts with O2 to make that red, crumbly rust material, Fe2O3. Okay? So those are the reactants and products, and now we just have to add coefficients. Um, so again, set something that's the most complicated to a coefficient of one. It looks like Fe2O3 has the most atoms in it out of all of our reactants and products. So let's give that a coefficient of one. Now remember, normally we don't write 
explicit coefficients of one. If there's no coefficient in front of something, we just leave it out. And that assumes that it's one. But we'll put a one there to remind ourselves that we're going to set that to one. And then if we look at the product side, we have two FEs, Fe203. So we need to have a two in front of iron. And then we have three oxygens. One times three is three. And so we need to have three halves O2 to balance that. All right, so again, we have a balanced reaction, but with fractional coefficients. So we're going to multiply everything by two, and we get 4Fe plus 3O2 goes to 2Fe2O3. So every coefficient gets double from what we started with, and now we can check our work. So on the reaction side and then the product side, we have to make sure that the number of atoms are the same of each type. So for iron, we have four irons, each with one atom in it. It's going to be four. And then on the product side, we have two Fe2O3s. Each has two irons, and so again, the total is four. All right, so coefficient times the subscript tells you the total number of iron atoms that are in there. And then for oxygen, we have three O2s, each with six. Sorry, each with two, and that gives us a total of six. And then on the product side, we have, again, two moles of product, each with three o oxygens. That also balances out to six. All right, so this one was not too terribly difficult either, but again, we had to double the coefficients if we want to get them into whole numbers, which we'll usually ask you to do. All right, and then finally, one last example of balancing reactions. This one's a, a special one to me because it was uh, one of the first reactions I ever did during my undergraduate research. Um, so you always remember your first one, and um, so we're gonna um, we're gonna talk about the compound cesium four rhenium six selenium eight I six. So it's a, a pretty complicated structure, and you can make this by just taking elemental rhenium Re, elemental selenium Se, cesium iodide CSI, and then elemental iodine, which is I two. You just mix them up in a tube, you cook them at eight hundred degrees Celsius for about four days, and then this compound comes out at the other end. All right, so that's how you do the reaction. But we want to write a balanced reaction. And then another way that we'll often ask the questions on the tests is we'll ask you to balance the reaction and give us the sum of the coefficients on either the reactants or the product side. That's kind of how we check to see if you balance it correctly. So that's what we're going to do here. So again, the balancing part is the same. We just have to follow directions and report the answer correctly. All right, so all the reactants are going to be Re, S, SE, which is selenium, CSI, and I2. Actually, I'm going to do this a little bit lower so I have more room. Sorry. So we write out the reactants and products first. Reactants on the left side. In this case, only one product. So when I first stepped into the lab as an undergrad, my, my advisor tested me and he said, okay, I want you to make this compound, figure out how much of each of the reactants you need to make that compound. So again, it comes down to balancing the reaction as the first step you have to do. So this was you know, the first reaction I had to balance as an undergraduate researcher. So it looks complicated, but again, we're gonna set one of the coefficients to one. That's obviously going to be this one. This is the most complicated species in this reaction. And so then the first thing we wanna look at are elements that only appear once on each side of the equation. So if you look at cesium, there's four cesiums in the product and only and cesium only appears here on the reactant side. So we can go ahead and put a coefficient of four in front of that. If we look at rhenium here, rhenium only appears here in the, in the reactant side, so it appears in the product and just once on the reactant side, so we can set its coefficient. There are six rhenium's in the products, so we need to have six on the reactant side. And then for selenium, again, it only appears once. There's eight seleniums, and it appears only there as a reactant, so we put an eight. Now, iodine is the one that's more complex a little bit because, as we see, there's iodine in, in the product, and there's iodine in two of the, of the reactants here. This one has iodine, this one has it. So we have a total of six iodines on the product side, I6. We've already added four from this reactant, and then we have I2. So we only need one I2 to balance that out. So we have just a coefficient of one in front of I2, and this reaction is balanced just like this. 
All right, so again, because iodine appears twice on the reactant side, that's one that we would want to balance last, which is what we did. And so we see that there's six in total in the product. Four plus two is six. So we don't have to add any coefficients to I2. It's just a coefficient of one. Now the question asks us to report the sum of the coefficients on the reactant side. So the sum is just going to be the six from the rhenium, eight from selenium, four from cesium iodide. And remember that when there's no coefficient, that is, that is implied as a coefficient of one. So don't forget if it's completely lacking a coefficient, it doesn't mean it doesn't have one or that it's zero. It means that it's actually one, so we have to include that. So don't forget about that one there. And that gives us a sum of 19. All right, so this one shows, I didn't write the ones in explicitly. If you don't have a coefficient in front of something, the coefficient is assumed to be just a one. All right, so that's going to be uh, how we balance reactions. Now let's move on um, to the next step, which is what we call stoichiometry. So stoichiometry is going to now allow us to convert amounts of reactants into amounts of products. So if we know how much of something we're reacting, we can figure out how much of a product we're forming and vice versa. And so stoichiometry requires us to have a balanced reaction. So we have to balance the reaction first before we start doing any of these stoichiometry calculations. But now that we know how to do that, let's look at the steps that are needed to do stoichiometry. So the definition of stoichiometry is calculating the, the, the amounts of reactants and or products involved in a chemical reaction. And the key point being that is if we know the amount of one substance that's involved in a chemical reaction, either a reactant or a product, we can calculate the amount of another substance that's going to participate in that same reaction, either as a reactant or if it's a product how much of that would form as a product. Now the key concept to doing stoichiometry are mole ratios. So remember that the coefficients in balanced chemical equations tell us the relative number of moles of each reactant and product that are involved in those reactions. So those coefficients are going to be interpreted as moles. Remember they don't represent masses, they represent molar amounts. And so that's what we're going to use to do stoichiometry are those coefficients. So we need to have a balanced reaction First, and those coefficients then tell us the ratios of each species that's involved. So the coefficients tell us the relative number of moles of each substance in the reaction. All right, so if we have this fictitious reaction here, 3A plus 2B goes to 4C, where again, those are just totally made up symbols, but let's say that's our chemical reaction with those coefficients. The coefficients in this balanced reaction are going to allow us to, to develop ratios of reactants and products that are involved and allow us to convert between them. So we can write a ratio, for example, three moles of A reacts for every two moles of B, we can write a, a ratio that three moles of A reacts for every four moles of C that forms. We can write a ratio two moles of B reacts for every four moles of C that forms, and so on. So we can write all these different ratios involving the coefficients in the chemical reaction that allow us to convert from, from the moles of one substance into the moles of another substance. And these are all then going to be valid conversion factors. or what we call unit factors, which means they're really just multiplying by one. All right, so there's a relationship then between the number of moles of each species that involved, and we can use these coefficients then to write ratios that we use as conversion factors. Okay, so let's kind of look at a roadmap then of how a, a typical stoichiometry problem works. Now the most common stoichiometry problem that we're going to start with is called a, a mass to mass. And so what this means is that we're going to give you the mass of one of the reactants and ask you, you know, how much of the other reactants you need, 
how much product can form, or if we say if this much product is formed, how much reaction was involved, and so on. So we're converting between masses of substance that are involved in the chemical reaction. So typically our starting point is going to be the masses of one of our substances. So we're giving you the amount of subs one of our substances. And the goal then is going to be to figure out what's the mass of another substance, either another reactant or a product, that's also involved in that same reaction. But there's no direct way to do this. We have to work through moles. So the key, the key quantity that we always need for a stoichiometry problem is moles. So at, we're going to go through and do a whole bunch of different types of stoichiometry problems, both in Chapter 5 and Chapter 6. And my first piece of advice is always, when in doubt, convert into moles. Because the moles are going to be the amounts that are going to be related to each other by the coefficients of the chemical reaction. So the first thing we're very often going to do is, if we have the mass of one of our substances, we're going to convert it into the moles. But we could also go in both directions. If we're given moles, we could convert back into mass if we need to. And remember, to do mass into moles, we just use the molecular weight of that substance. All right, so we've already built up a lot of our toolbox to be able to do this. I wrote up twice. So if we know the molar mass of substance A, we can convert the grams or the, you know, we can convert its mass into moles. And then once we have the moles of substance A, we can convert into moles of substance B using the coefficients from the balanced reaction. All right, so this is why I said that moles is going to be the key quantity that you need for stoichiometry because in order to use those ratios from the balanced reaction, those stoichiometric coefficients, you need to be in moles. And so we're going to use the, the coefficients from the balanced reaction to convert moles of one substance into moles of another or vice versa. And then once we have moles of one sub of that substance, if we want to go back and calculate the mass of that substance, then we can use the molar mass of that substance to get it back into, into a mass amount. All right, so this is sort of the typical roadmap for a stoichiometry problem. You want to figure out amounts of substances that are involved in a reaction. The most convenient amount that we're going to start with is, is mass, usually in grams. And we can use molar masses converting to moles. We can use coefficients to convert between moles of two different substances and so on. All right, so then is, and then one last final wrinkle we could throw at you is if we ask you for the number of atoms or molecules that are involved, if you have Avogadro's number, you can use that. So again, if we, if we know the moles and we want to know the individual number of atoms or molecules, we can use that 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd to convert to that. We can do the same thing for substance B. So that's not as common. The mass to mass is the more common, um, but sometimes we'll have you do that as well. All right, so again, those things that we now have in our toolbox, two different ways of converting different quantities into moles. The molar mass, which gets us from grams into moles, and Avogadro's number, which gets us from moles into number of particles, number of atoms or molecules. So both of those can come into play in stoichiometry. All right, so let's do a few examples. We won't have time for all these today, but I'll at least go through one of them, and then the other ones I can either push off till next time or just do them in the, in the notes uh, I haven't said yet. All right, so let's start with this one. We have, this is how you can dissolve gold using what's called aqua regia. You take gold, you mix it with nitric acid and hydrochloric acid, and you form this soluble uh, compound of gold and then some byproducts. So we want to know how many molecules of water are formed when 2.56 grams of gold is completely converted into this product here. All right, so we're looking, again, for these types of problems, start with what you're looking for. We're looking for the molecules of water, the number of molecules of water. And we're going to start them with our given amount, which is amount of gold. So we're told that we're reacting 2.56 grams of gold, and we want to know how much water forms when all of those 2.56 grams are converted into the products. All right, so we're looking for the amount of water that's formed. 
So like I said, the first thing we should do when in doubt is convert into moles because the relationship between the amount of gold that's involved in this reaction and the amount of water that's formed is going to be in those mole ratios. So we have to convert to moles first. So there's one mole of gold, and we use the atomic mass of gold from the periodic table, which is 196.97. That comes straight from the periodic table. And then once we're in moles of one substance, we can convert into moles of the other substance. We're trying to find something about water here by using the coefficients from the balanced reaction. So if we look at the coefficients in the reaction, we want moles of gold to cancel out. We want to convert it into moles of water. And so the ratio then is going to be just the coefficients from the reaction. So water has a two in front of it. So we have two moles of water. And then gold has no coefficient in front of it, which is a one. So there's going to be two moles of water formed for every one mole of gold that reacts. So this is the key ratio here that allows us to convert between moles of gold and moles of water using just the coefficients from the balanced reaction. Now that we're in moles of water, the last thing we have to do is convert into water molecules or the number of molecules of water. And remember that's going to be Avogadro's number. So moles will cancel out if we multiply by Avogadro's number. And so when we, when we work out the math, we get 1.56 times 10 to the 22nd molecules of water. All right. Uh, all right, and then I will I'll put off the next one until next time because we're running out of time. Um, so that gives us an introduction. We'll review this and start with some new things next time.